Welcome back to the afternoon sessions of the, Belt, the fifth Belt and Road Conference of the Law Society of Hong Kong. My name is Hin Han, and I'm a council member of the Law Society of Hong Kong. It is my pleasure to facilitate the afternoon sessions today. Without further ado, let's now begin our discussion of session three, titled, Towards a New Global Currency to Reduce Barriers to Trade. The panel discussion will focus on whether we can increase trade along countries that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative as we discuss the deployment, development, opportunities, and challenges of designating or using a new global currency and the role and the use of crypto, digital currencies, DeFi, DAOs, and blockchain technologies. If you have any questions for the speakers, please do write your questions on the question slip in your folder. If you're joining online, please type your questions on the Q&A box. Please join me in welcoming the moderator of this session, Mr. Christopher Yu, the Vice President of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Joining Mr. Yu for this discussion, please welcome Mr. Uh, sorry, Ms. Elena Evankia, the Vice President of the Russian uh, Federal Bar Association. She's joining us virtually today. We also have with us Mr. Eddie Tam, MPPM, who is the CEO, CIO, and Portfolio Manager of Central Asset Investments. We, al <laughs> we also have with us Dr. Stephen Wong, Senior Vice President and Executive Director of the Public Policy Institute of our Hong Kong Foundation. Thank you. Distinguished guests, welcome back. I hope you all had an enjoyable lunch. We had a very insightful and thought-provoking morning on regulation of metaverse. This afternoon, we turn to something more practical and relatable. Let's talk about money. There are 149 countries in the BRI and they accounted for over 11 trillion US dollar of trade last year. According to a recent IMF report, there's an ongoing trend of decline in the use of US dollar in foreign exchange reserves and in trades. Is the world moving towards a new global currency? In this session, we will discuss the deployment, development, opportunities and challenges of designating or using a new global currency to facilitate international trade along the Belt and Road, as well as the role of use of cryptos, digital currencies, Delphi, DAOs, and blockchain technologies. As an international and modern city, Hong Kong also attaches great importance to this topic. The Hong Kong SAR government recently issued a policy statement on the development of virtual assets and virtual currencies in Hong Kong. The statement sets out the, goal, the government's policy stance and approach towards developing a vibrant sector and ecosystem for virtual assets and virtual currencies in Hong Kong. This demonstrates our government's vision in supporting the development of this newly emerged medium of property. Hong Kong, supported by its robust infrastructure, internationally aligned regulatory regimes, a full range of financial products, and free flow of information and capital, can provide a flexible but predictable market-oriented and internationalized business environment to global investors. Just two months ago, Hong Kong was ranked fourth globally in the Global Financial Centers Index Report published by Zen Yen, which is a think tank based in London. With Hong Kong's policies advantage, rich talent pool, and robust legal system, Hong Kong is certainly a, a hinterland for development of virtual assets and virtual currencies. Today, we have the pleasure 
to be joined by other jurisdictions along the Belt and Road to study this topic of mutual interest. I have the honor to introduce to you our distinguished speakers on this session's panel. The first up is Ms. Elena Avakian, Vice President of Russia Federal Bar Association. Elena has extensive legislative drafting experience, including working on governing the capital markets sector, corporate relations, insolvency procedures, commercial litigation, and more. She was repeatedly involved in drafting the decrees of the Presidium and Plenum of Supreme Arbitrage Court of Russia. Elena is an active state councillor of the Russia Federation, second class. She was awarded the Russian, Fed Russian Judicial System Honorable Charter and is commanded by the Court of Intellectual Rights. In 2020, Elena was named Woman of the Year at the European Woman of Legal Tech Awards. In 2021, she was included in the Best Lawyers Rating. Please put together your hands for Elena. And Elena, this, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. It's a great honor to have a chance to speak on this forum. But uh, as I'm starting, I think that uh, I will try to ask questions, not give answers, because nowadays on the, the floor of scriptures and uh, CBDC, there are more questions than answers. But anyway, speaking about global currency, we have to first ask all of us a question, whether we need a global currency, whether we need something to replace the global currency that already exists, or we need something else which we have to plus to these global currencies, or we need something that will replace currencies as it is, and we need something that will be universal currency. Can it be crypto? Can it be something that uh, will be the currency of uh, public confidence? Or we need something that will be fiat, as all our, our currencies are now? These questions we have to discuss today, because without answers on this question, we, we can't find out the way. Why we need new global currency? Why we need to find out some other ways than, than we have today? Because the first question of all cryptos is a question of expenses. Today, our banking systems, all banking systems of the entire world, uh, just prove their weakness. And the situation around Russia, the situation around sanctions and all this mess up that's going on today uh, just proved the weakness of uh, banking system, proved the weakness of ordinary institutes of banking regulations. In this case, we're going to find out the way that will give us a chance to establish the new a uh, transparent and uh, normal system that give us a chance to make a global exchange, that make us a chance to pay in every time without influence of that or this country, without pressure of these or that countries. In this case, the way out from this uh, situation is some sort of cryptocurrency. The, the question for cryptocurrencies, first of all, that the cryptocurrency is a currency of public confidence and nothing except and nothing except public confidence give the crypto their uh, give the crypto their own value there is no other value except public confidence and if public sentiments just change their current cryptos became just a piece of digital paper. In this case, we need something else. What is this something else? Is it CBDC? The CBDC, what is this CBDC today? It's a digital currency of a central banks. It's a real fiat, digital fiat. 
it's only another way to provide nothing else it's just the same fear that we have again uh, that we have now in this case it doesn't matter what is it a digital ruble or digital dollar or a digital yuan or digital hong kong dollar it's fiat of hong kong russia united states and so on and so far in this case digital currencies they have the same illness that the normal ordinary currencies have so starting our discussion i just want to find out and answer the question whether we really need something else except our global currencies that have already exist whether we understand what these else have to be thank you Thank you, Elena. Also on our panel today is Mr. Eddie Tam, the founder, CEO, and CIO of Central Asset Investments. He oversees the management of the firm as well as the firm's CAI Global Funds. Under his leadership, the CAI Global Fund was ranked the first on best performing multi-strategy hedge fund globally, according to Bloomberg and Barclay Hatch in 2013. Eddie has over 30 years of experience in the financial industry and was credited as one of the pioneers in Asian equity derivatives, previously heading the derivative sales and marketing at Credit Lyonnais and Merrill Lynch. In, and in 2010, Eddie was named one of the 25 most influential people in Asia hedge funds by Asia Investor. Please welcome Eddie to our panel. Eddie has a um, PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to join this uh, distinguished panel. Um, I'm quite traditional, and I'm very uh, sort of um, facts and data driven. So I'll share with you some of the current situation, and, and then we can proceed and think about the future. So I think it's undeniable that uh, the U.S. dollar is still the dominant uh, global currency. Uh, it accounts for roughly 60% of uh, global reserves, about 38-39% of trade settlement. Most importantly, in FX trading, uh, around 90% of FX trading in the world, uh, one of the legs is U.S. dollar. So if you convert from, let's say, euro to yen, normally you go through the U.S. dollar first and then you convert to the yen. So it's tremendously convenient, the, uh, the transaction costs are lowest. And uh, this is right, quite remarkable because if you think about it, uh, the, US doll, the U.S. economy uh, after World War II uh, was roughly 50% of the world GDP. And now with the rise of China and the development of the rest of the world, now U.S. GDP is less than 25%. It's like maybe 23% in nominal terms of the global GDP. China in nominal terms is about 16%. In PPP terms, actually, it has already exceeded the U.S. back in 2014, 2015. So that actually poses the first question. Why is China's nominal GDP so much smaller than its PPP GDP? So that implies an extreme undervaluation of the UN, of the uh, renminbi. So anyway, the point is, um, given the demise or the decline, not demise, I guess, right, the decline of the American economy's uh, size uh, relative to the world, why has the dollar remained dominant? So there got to be some reason for it, right? So, and uh, you know, to think about. Uh, uh, potential challenger. I, I think uh, the two most obvious ones are probably the UN, uh, given that China has exceeded the US already in terms of real uh, PPP uh, GDP. And the other hot one to discuss is, of course, like various kinds of cryptocurrency, I guess, including, you know, various uh, uh, CBDC uh, efforts by different governments. 
um, you know, I, I'm not going to talk much about the, the yen or the euro because I guess you can roughly say that there's in the Western camp. Um, so anyway, uh, let's look at a little bit more data. So, uh, you know, this, despite all the talk uh, of uh, the coming demise of the U.S. dollar regime, the dominance, but of course this year in particular, because of various reasons, including the war in Ukraine and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, slowdown in China and other reasons, the dollar has surged to a value which is the highest in the last uh, 30, 40 years, 40 years. Of course, there's also the reason of uh, uh, the Fed raising interest rate, uh, and it's relative to the, you know, uh, actions of other central banks which have been uh, slower, you know, more modest. In fact, China is the only major economy which has been trying to ease. So the uh, PBOC has actually cut interest rate and cut reserve requirements. So, so anyway, the evidence is on the table. It's very clear. The dollar is not going away. It's not collapsing. Sorry. And this is just uh, confirming my point. Uh, maybe along the Belt and Road, uh, its use and the uh, percentage of reserves has declined a little bit. I, get, I, get, I think mostly because Russia in the last few years has sold almost all its U.S. dollar reserves and switched to renminbi. So I think along the Belt and Road, maybe there's uh, more. There's more evidence of. Uh, declining use of a uh, dollar, but globally speaking, not, not the case at all. And uh, yeah, this shows you uh, in nominal terms, China's GDP is still second in the world, but in real terms, in PPP terms, PPP stands for purchasing power parity. So it's kind of like the real purchasing power of uh, the UN. Based on that, it already exceeded the US a long time ago. So the question again, if you think about it, is why is the nominal GDP of China still lacking the U.S.? In fact, last year it it closed the gap a lot. Last year, China's GDP was 77 percent of the U.S. GDP. But given the depreciation of the yuan, and also uh, actually this year China's growth slowed down, and also China's inflation is lower than the U.S. Right. So this year, the nominal GDP of U.S has once again widened this gap, its lead over China. So likely this year, China will fall back below 70% of US in terms of nominal GDP. So I think it's a bit sad, actually, to be honest. I think, uh, you know, uh, everybody talks about the WTO moment of China in 2001. After joining the WTO, of course, China grew by uh, leaps and bounds. And, you know, um, yeah, we caught up very quickly. I think a few years ago when, we, when the renminbi got included into the IMF's SDR basket, that was a financial WTO moment. And then following that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the A-shares index also joined the MSCI Global Index and the funds uh, and the bonds joined the Barclays Index and so on. But unlike the, uh, you know, industrial WTO moment, China basically failed to capture this opportunity and promote and, uh, you know, didn't catapult basically, uh, you know, the UN into a, in a, into a greater and more important position. So despite the fact that, like, SDR gave the UN over 10% weighting in its basket, uh, like I said, I think globally almost no country other than Russia has a weighting of more than maybe 2% uh, in renminbi. And, you know, again, similarly, like, MSCI gave A shares uh, together with Hong Kong and the, uh, you know, uh, ADRs listed in the U.S., uh, I think well over 10% weighting, but given everything that is happening, uh, the un it's underweighted by at least 300 basis points and likely to decline and also likely MSCI re re will, uh, you know, because it's shrunk so much, the Chinese equity market, so it will likely reduce the weighting in its uh, index uh, in next time, actually, fairly soon. So I don't have much time. We can talk more about this, but, but I think... Uh, to come back to answer my own question, why, why is the uh, UN failing to challenge the dollar? I think mainly it's because we have a closed capital account. So when you have a closed capital account, people don't find it that useful to hold, hold the UN, so they're underweighted. So therefore, it's undervalued. And uh, this is also a source of uh, international friction with the rest of the world because China runs trade surplus with well over 100 countries around the world. It's not just the US or even Europe. Uh, it's really with most of our trading partners, we run significant surpluses, and that's a bit of an issue.
Uh, yeah, and recently, you know, of course, people are reducing waiting in China even more. Uh, let me just skip forward very quickly. Uh, just two seconds on on uh, crypto. Of course, actually, you know, um, last two days, if you've been following the news, uh, the, the collapse of FTX is very important. And so th there's a contradiction. Crypto is not the solution to every problem, to be honest. Right? It's meant to be decentralized finance. But I don't know whether you're aware or not, but uh, exchanges such as FTX or Binance or Coinbase, they're what they call CDFI. It's called centralized decentralized finance. It makes my head spin. In fact, it's, it's a fallacy. If you think when you trade on Binance or FTX that you are actually trading the crypto directly, it's not. The only time they update the blockchain is when you deposit and when you withdraw because there's so many transactions and blockchain technology is so inefficient. They cannot update it every time. So all the trading activities on like Binance are recorded only on Binance's own servers. So therefore, it's actually vulnerable to hacking. And with the demise of uh, FTX, actually, the, the DeFi world has become even more centralized because now more of the trading will go to Binance, basically. And also, because of the problems there, it's going to invite more investigation and more regulation. So I think the U.S. in particular, of course, China has banned crypto altogether a long time ago. But uh, the U.S. has been tolerating it because stable coins is the bridge from the cryptocurrency back to the U.S. dollar regime. So in many ways, the crypto world in the last three years or so has surrendered to the U.S. dollar regime. So that's why the U.S., in my humble opinion, has been tolerating the existence of the crypto world. But if they create more problems for them, they will uh, investigate and they will regulate uh, crypto even more. So final word on CBDC. Uh, China was a pioneer. Uh, you know, we have been experimenting with uh, 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 DCEP for four years. But I'm sorry, I'm facts-based, I'm data-driven. So far in four years, I think the total transaction volume is like $16 billion. Uh, in one month, uh, Alipay, and I'm sure similarly for WeChat Pay, uh, they process well for one trillion. So with these technologies, if they are really popular, it's bottom-up, it's like consumer-driven, they would have taken off already. So clearly, there are major technical and other uh, issues, technical challenges to the adoption of CBDC. Again, other countries can try different things, but China by far was on the bleeding edge. And so far, four years down, 16 billion total transaction is not a great success story. And I think even Elena pointed out, just because you put something on blockchain, money mostly is digital already. So it's a matter of whether it's on a blockchain or not. And blockchain has its sort of advantages, but it also comes with a lot of baggages. So there's an impossible trinity in the crypto world between energy, efficiency, and security. And it's impossible to balance all three uh, in a perfect way. So it's similar to the impossible trinity in macroeconomics. So uh, yeah, that have been Numerous examples of such failure, like the Lunar Terra uh, failure. I, uh, one final word. I, I know Hong Kong is also trying to explore digital currency, so-called. I think it's a worthwhile effort because Hong Kong is also under threat in case of U.S. sanctions. So I've been thinking about the problem. How do you maintain the pack to the dollar? Is it possible to do it without holding U.S. dollar assets? And Lunar Terra was a second generation stablecoin which attempt to do that through an algorithmic or arbitrage manner. Instead of like US uh, DT or US DC, which are similar to Hong Kong dollar pack, they hold supposedly a lot of high quality dollar assets to back up the stablecoin. But Lunar Terra was trying to do it in a virtual way, but obviously they failed. I think the failure is not just technical, it's because Do Wan and this uh, Terra Lab, whatever, uh, lacks the credibility. So I think actually if you can come up with a third generation stablecoin using the full force of HKMA and maybe PBOC to back it up, maybe that's a way to maintain the pack without holding the uh, US dollar uh, assets. That therefore may be possibly making us a little bit, little bit less vulnerable to the arbitrary sanctions of the US. But this is a clear, this is at this stage a, a, a thought experiment on my part. I've, I've, I've touched upon this in my writing, but um, I don't think uh, HKMA has uh, followed up on that yet. But I, I think it's a worthwhile intellectual exercise. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie, and, uh, for the very interesting discussion. Uh, last, but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Stephen Wong is also with us on this panel. He's the Senior Vice President and Executive Director 
of Public Policy Institute of our Hong Kong Foundation. Stephen received his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Chicago and Master of Arts in East Asian Studies from Yale University. He completed his doctorate degree in public administration from the University of Hong Kong. Stephen began his career as an investment banker and held regional management positions with several global financial institutions, including as ED or at UBS in London and Managing Director at RBS. He's also a member of the Legislative Council. Please welcome uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Wong. Thank you. Um, I want to focus uh, on my sharing on what is currently being done in using blockchain technology to facilitate cross-border payment and trade documentation in the context of Hong Kong and mainland China, which may have interesting implications uh, for reducing trade barriers within the Belt and Road region, which is what really uh, our topic for this panel. In other words, I want to focus on and explore the cross-border payment as a potential utility of digital currency. An important context is that, um, as uh, Eddie said, um, uh, China is, um, you know, uh, being a key player in the international trade along the Belt and Road. Um, but basically, China has uh, imposed a blanket ban on all types of crypto transactions, including bitcoins and all kinds of uh, stable coins. Um, so in this context, um, however, Bank of International Settlements, BIS, uh, people call it International Bank of Central Banks, set up various innovation hubs across the globe and has been developing CBDC cross-border prototype working together with uh, many central banks. So I would like to share three examples. The first one is uh, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has set up its own CBDC project, both on the retail and wholesale level. Uh, on the wholesale level, what they call the Enbridged project is particularly relevant to, I guess, our topic of today, uh, which is a platform for CBDC cross-border transaction among corporate and financial institutions. Hong Kong MA and Bank of, Eng Bank, of Bank of Thailand initiated this project in 2017, and afterwards, uh, the Central Bank of uh, China and UAE has joined afterwards. The pilot of this Enbridge, uh, not going into detail, has sort of validated proposition that CBDC can substantially increase the speed of cross-border payments from multiple days to nearly real, to nearly real time and also reduce the cost, as uh, Elena has re referred to. Um, I must uh, repeat here, though, that China does adopt a cautious approach towards uh, digital currency, uh, but even being so cautious, they have joined this Enbridge prototype and pilot studies. Um, and I guess this is um, this Enbridge is the only overseas cross-border CBDC project that China has joined um, to handle uh, so sort of the, I guess, Enbridge should therefore be a potential platform to handle trade payments along the uh, Belt and Road uh, that we discussed today. At the same time, um, there are two other examples aside from this Enbridge project in Hong Kong. Uh, there are two other examples I'd like to share with you. One is um, the BIS has another leading cross-border CBDC project called Project Number. This project brings together Reserve Bank of Australia, Central Bank of Malaysia, um, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and South Africa Reserve Bank to design multi-CBDC shared settlement platform to test the use of CBDC for international settlements. And the third example I'd like to give it to you is uh, BIS has also uh, uh, concluded a cross-border wholesale CBDC experiment with Bank of France and Swiss National Bank called Project Jura. This project explores selling foreign exchange transactions in Euro and Swiss franc on wholesale CBDCs. So these three examples are in various, um, you can call it pilots or prototypes, are in various experimental and developmental stage. And I think this is an interesting space to watch. And aside from digital currency, in our discussions above, CBDC in particular may be an interesting use of blockchain technology in lowering trade barriers. Another use case is, uh, for blockchain is trade documentation, which I think 
eventually may be interesting to anticipate, anticipate any potential merge of the cross-border payment by CBDC and documentation efficiency by a lot of these blockchain trade platform in an integrated blockchain platform manner. Uh, given time, uh, I will just uh, jump sort of the conclusion. Um, I think, uh, as, you, as you know, some of these uh, E-Trade platform by Hong Kong is called the E-Trade Connect, which cuts down a lot of documentation processes using blockchain technology. So I guess, uh, as Eddie said, it may be an inter in, in another intellectually interesting exercise or that, that may be worthy to continue to think about how to um, integrate this Ambridge exercise as well as this E-Trade Connect in an operable platform to optimize documentation, verification, and payment processing. Uh, for example, setting conditional payments uh, on these integrated platforms, which allow payment to be initiated automatically upon the fulfillment of predefined con conditions. Uh, in this way, uh, the potential of digital currency to lower trade barrier may be able to further extend it and leverage. With all these uh, discussions are still, in, are still admittedly in experimental phases, but given the global attention and efforts being paid in this space, I think it may be interesting to watch out in this space further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now it's uh, Q&A time. Uh, let me see. Uh, bef before I take on any uh, questions from the floor, and from online, I, I do actually have a few questions to follow up with uh, the panelists. Um, the first question I have is for Lena. Um, if there were a new global um, currency, how do we actually overcome, having seen what happened with crypto and stablecoin, how, how do we actually overcome the concern relating to AML and counter finance, uh, counter terrorist finance, wearing my lawyers and uh, regular regulators had. Um, who... Yes, uh, thank, you for, thank you very much for your question. I, I can answer on this way that it's a good question for lawyers all around the world because no one knows how we will have to go through KYC and AML without, you know, this hybrid structure. Uh, today, nowadays, we have no uh, entire currency except a hybrid, or a hybrid one, when central bank and other banks participate in the whole structure. So we can't avoid this influence of banks. We can't avoid the influence of those who will just open the door to the blockchain for participants of the overall. In this case, uh, the question of KYC and DMN will be on the hands of banking system. In this case, the control will be on the, uh, on the hands of central banks anyway. So it will be question, first of all, whether central banks are going to connect in this global universe platform. I think the answer is no, they can't. They can't be equal on this platform and without equality, they can't really participate in a global platform because these are the central banks starting to try to control, starting to capture this control. And it seems for me that it will be not be the central bank of Russia. It first of all will be Federal Reserve System, if I'm not mistaken, because they are, nowadays they try to capture and close even in blockchain of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. In this case, it seems that the quality of such a platform will be just agree. And if it works like this, so the question of AML and QAC will be differ very much from state to state, from regulation to regulation. And I think that the global platform today today will fail. And to have such a global system, we need something to be changed in a global politics, first of all. Not in legal. <laughs> Thank you. Do, you uh, do panelists have anything to add? Okay. Um, okay. The, I have a question for um, uh, 
Eddie. Um, uh, what are the challenges in, um, in uh, having a representative international organization such as UN or IMF uh, to lead the development of a truly global uh, currency? A uh, very good question. I, I've been thinking and I've actually written articles suggesting this. I think UN ought to be empowered uh, and not be weakened uh, by the international community. I, I think this is beyond uh, currency. I think it's, it's just moronic, idiotic, and ultimately uh, self-destructive to still divide our very small planet into 193 countries. We ought to be moving towards a, some kind of a global, if not government, but you know, much more global uh, coordination in, in various uh, domains, including currency, including governance, in term, maybe perhaps even in uh, military. So anyway, uh, on the currency issue, like I said, there is a virtual currency already. It's called SDR, it's called Special Drawing Rights. Uh, BIS, I guess, in terms of regulator, is, as Stephen says, the central bank to the world central banks. But in terms of uh, actual uh, lending function, actually IMF is the central bank to the central bank. So whenever you see, you know, uh, various EM countries in history getting into trouble, they, they go to IMF for, for help. And maybe soon even G7 countries may have to, <laughs> which shall be unnamed, but they may have to go to IMF for help. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, IMF's function is like a central bank. So in that case, why don't they make uh, SDR a global currency? So that is certainly a possibility, I think. And uh, I guess nowadays, if you want to make SDR a real currency, you may as well make it crypto. So you can put it on the blockchain, right? I think that kind of like Euro at the beginning, they did, didn't, issue, didn't issue nooks and coins yet, right? At the beginning, they already had EM, uh, EMS and then EMU, and then ultimately they issue the cash, which is a smaller part of the money supply. So I, I would support that. But the problem is that IMF does not have capital raising ability. I think various countries do deposit money with it. That's why they have the special drawing rights. Uh, but they have no taxation ability. UN does not tax the world. And they cannot issue global bonds. So without the ability to uh, tax and to issue bonds and, and such, then they are quite powerless. I think IMF, I, I forgot what's the size of the balance sheet. I'm, 200% sure that their balance sheet is much smaller than the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet itself used to be very small. It used to be $700 billion only before the GFC, before 2008. And then it grew to $3 trillion, then fell back to 2 and, and then it went to 8 And now it's still over $7 trillion. I'm pretty sure IMF's balance sheet is uh, laughably small. So I think conceptually, yes, SDR can be a global currency, uh, but it's not. And I don't see plans from the major powers uh, in the world supporting this plan. Um, let's hope time will help us in that direction. Um, um, there are a couple of questions going uh, uh, through the uh, online uh, audience. Um, this one is for Stephen. Um, the questions are, what are the prospects of yuan becoming a belt and roll currency or even a global currency? And, <laughs> and that's a question for Eddie. <laughs> uh, I think I simply laid out um, what is going on, uh, what are the experiments uh, that, that, that is related, trade related, uh, that is using blockchain with existing currencies. Right, so um, so when I see the title here, quote unquote, global currency, I, I, I take it as you're not in, inventing, or you can, but what, what I was trying to say is a lot of interesting experiments going on using technology with existing currencies to cut down on the trade barriers uh, in terms of uh, settlement time, settlement, settlement time, settlement cost, uh, and as well as uh, in terms of trade documentation on the, on the blockchain. Eddie, do you want to have supplement that? Well, I totally support the interna internationalization of the UN, be it on the Belt and Road or globally. But as I said, the fundamental problem 
it's not a technology issue. It's not whether it's digital or it's on the blockchain. Not it's it's the fact that uh, China seemingly does not want to open its capital account. And when you have a closed capital account, and in fact, I'm sorry to say, but over the last five years, let's say, capital controls have been increasing, not decreasing. So it's harder to get money out of China now than five years ago. The, the quota has gone down, actually. So when that is the case, it's simply very difficult for uh, other uh, people around the world, central banks and companies and individuals to want to hold the uh, renminbi. In fact, if I'm not correct, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, even in Hong Kong, where, where we are the you know, major uh, off, so-called offshore uh, renminbi trading center, the amount of renminbi deposits in Hong Kong has probably declined by half over the last 10 years. So even in Hong Kong, the amount of uh, renminbi has shrunk instead of increasing, again, despite the relatively high growth rate of China's economy, at least until like last couple of years. So that is a fundamental problem. So I think to address it, you have to think about the, you know, the opening up uh, the capital accounts, and there's no two ways around it. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up, uh, the question is being asked, should the Hong Kong dollar be packed to the renminbi Given the U.S. is um, yeah, using um, increasingly the um, uh, dollar as a tool uh, in in the international stage, st uh, stage. Yeah. I know uh, you mentioned about the current accounts, you know, uh, issue. I think um, until and unless this I issue is addressed, I think your Hong Kong dollar being packed to renminbi would that be attractive? For the, yes. Well, I think uh, under one country, two system, I think uh, one of the fundamental values of Hong Kong is the pack to the dollar. So unfortunately, I think uh, not only capital account, but obviously physical travel to mainland China remains very challenging. Well, even the Hong Kong, we still have some challenges, but you know, zero plus three makes it a little bit more, uh, you know, palatable for many people, right? So. I think uh, Hong Kong's value, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's raison d'etre for 200 years and remains the, the case is because we're slightly different from the mainland. So the Hong Kong dollar pack indeed has served a, uh, a purpose for the last 40 years plus. And I think uh, f fundamentally, uh, as long as the RMB remains quite closed, the capital account of the mainland remains closed, Therefore, you need Hong Kong to be more open. You see what I mean? So, so the peg serves a purpose to the dollar. So if we were to be pegged to the renminbi, then I think we lose part of our raison d'etre in Hong Kong. But I do think that there's a possibility of changing the peg to a basket of currency similar to uh, CFTES, whatever they call it in China, or a little bit similar to Singapore. I think that's worthwhile to think about. Uh, but directly packing to the UN, I don't think would be the first priority. Uh, however, there is a scenario where I can see that is if the renminbi continues to depreciate and it crosses the 7.8 mark, <laughs> then maybe we will just, you know, conveniently be dragged along to to the UN. I, I think it's difficult to imagine, not impossible, to imagine the UN trading below the do Hong Kong dollar. I think there, there are various issues to that scenario. From, a, from an investor and from an asset management perspective, would, how would the foreign investors or people with wealth having um, properties and currencies based in Hong Kong dollar, how would they think if, if they were to um, uh, consider a renminbi or basket of uh, currency? I think any change would be traumatic. It's very simple. Uh, investors don't like uncertainty. So any change of regime, be it packing to the renminbi or to a basket or whatever, the immediate knee-jerk reaction would be pretty significant drop in all asset prices in Hong Kong, uh, including property and stocks, uh, et cetera, first. And then before rebounding or stabilizing at whatever you know, fair market value there is. So, so the volatility will be quite tremendous, I would imagine, in such a scenario. But I, I think, unfortunately, Hong Kong and uh, Beijing need to think about these issues because there are dark clouds looming over us. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we can say whatever we want. I mean, like HKMA, obviously, you know, we have enough uh, reserve to back up the Hong Kong dollar. I have no doubt about that, right? It's a 19th century kind of currency bought system. So I, I'm pretty sure we have enough reserve to back up M0, M1, M2. I'm not sure if we have enough US dollar to back it up all the way to, I don't know, M3, M4, M5. I mean, you know, money concept is very abstract nowadays. So uh, that I don't know. But I think, like I said, implied at the beginning, I think we are realistically vulnerable to US sanctions. Like we already see individuals being sanctioned already, uh, major officials in Hong Kong government. But I think institutionally, uh, we are at risk. Uh, I, I don't want to name the risk now. I mean, the, you can read the newspaper. I mean, the US is quite aggressive. Uh, there, there are uh, meaningful risks to, to the dollar pack. That's why I said, maybe we can explore some kind of algorithmic pack to the dollar. Uh, but after the failure of Luna Terra, it's, it's not really um, respectable to suggest that idea anymore. Like to, to talk about, uh, you know, second generation stablecoin makes me sound foolish. So I would call it the third generation. Can we improve upon, you know, um, the second generation? And I think uh, if uh, HKMA and PBOC put their full backing behind such a project, of course they have uh, much more credibility than the future Tiff Do Wan, who is hiding. <laughs> uh, so uh, he's the most hated person in Korea, apparently. Uh, but we do have to be careful because, again, just last couple of nights we've seen the collapse, uh, complete collapse of FTX and so on. So crypto may not be the answer to, to everything, to every problem. But I think for Hong Kong, the urgency is there to find a way out, to, th to find an alternative. Maybe this is the direction where the think tank, like uh, Stephen, could uh, help, um, help uh, guide the government and various bureaus to consider as an alternative, you know, time. Uh, uh, um, the world is changing. Hong Kong's circumstances are also changing. When you talk about the U.S. Uh, do Hong Kong dollar pack to um, uh, U.S. dollar and how we can evolve potentially uh, into a e Hong Kong dollar, I think that's quite attractive. Uh, but lots of challenges still. Uh, uh. It's more than putting on a blockchain. Ideally, you want to pack it to the dollar. That serves the purpose of the country. But how do you do it without holding U.S. dollar assets or being uh, yeah, the, the trick is how do you do it, how do you maintain that without being as vulnerable? I cannot say you eliminate all the risk, but you know, how do you minimize the risk of being sanctioned? So that's the challenge. Otherwise, if you really cannot do that, then I think... I think it's conceivable nowadays, I think it is okay to discuss it openly, is to, yeah, bite the bullet and think about changing the pack system altogether. So, but then it's hard to imagine that even if you pack it to the basket, that the basket does not include US dollar, or proportionally, I guess uh, it would have to be 60% dollar anyway. So that's a slight improvement to 100% dollar, but still, you would still be vulnerable. So something more has to be done, perhaps. Well, um, that um, are all the questions from the online and from myself. And um, unless there are any more questions on the floor, I would therefore um, want to say thank you. I hope you all enjoy a valuable uh, session with our distinguished panel of speakers on the designations and use of a new global currencies and the Barrett and Road initiatives. And on behalf of the Law Society of Hong Kong, I'd like to express our immense gratitude to Elena, Eddie, and Stephen. And may I ask you to all join you all to put your hands together to thank them. Thank you very much for the valuable insights. I learned a lot about money matters and the global currency. May I now invite Mr. Yu to present souvenirs to our honorable guests.
discussion of session three has now come to an end.